everyone. My name is Fleur Prince and welcome to the live Women Rock IT broadcast for Asia, Pacific and Japan. We have around 5,000 participants joining us today from Facebook and from YouTube. And I'd like to welcome each and every one of you. Thank you for being here. I am excited and I know that you will be inspired by our speakers today. Before I introduce the speakers, I have three things that I'd like to share with you. First of all, I'd like to send a special welcome to our ITU participants in joining us today as we celebrate the International Girls in ICT Day. I'd also like to welcome the many instructors and students joining across the region and those of you who are ready to kickstart a career in IT. Number two, Good news is that by being part of today's live broadcast, it means that it entitles you to our free online courses. So you have access to courses such as an introduction to the Internet of Things, into cybersecurity, Python, that's if you're interested in coding, Linux, and entrepreneurship. Details about course enrollments will be posted during today's event in the chat box. Please keep an eye out and I encourage you to click on the link and find out what these courses are about. And then number three, if you have any questions and I encourage you to share them, please type them into the chat box in Facebook and in YouTube or share them via Twitter with the hashtag WomenRockIT. I will hold the questions until after both speakers have finished their presentation and then we move on to Q&A. Now, I'd like to introduce to you our two incredible speakers for today. We are going to hear from Dr. Katrina Wallace. She has been recognized as the most influential woman in business and entrepreneurship by the Australian Financial Review. And she is the founder and executive director of Flamingo AI. We also have Niveda. She is our second speaker joining from India and she has become the guardian of the planet and you will find out why during her presentation. She's also the founder of Trashcom. I promise you that this is going to be good. These incredible women will share their dreams, their journey and how they are changing the world for the better by using Trashbots and artificial intelligence. Let's get it. let's go ahead and get started. Please welcome Katrina Wallace. Katrina, thank you for being here. And I'm going to hand over you, to you. And when you're ready, please feel free to start. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Fleur. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here to be sharing my story and hopefully give some insights into being uh, a woman in tech and a woman leader. So I'd like to start, and if we could just move the slides down to my first page, uh, talking a little bit about my, my story. As Fleur mentioned, I am the founder and executive director of an artificial intelligence company called Flamingo AI. And we were the second only woman-led business, so woman CEO and woman chair, ever to list on the Australian Stock Exchange, which we are very proud about, but also quite disturbed about when we found out we were the second only woman-led business to do that. It really showed us that there's still a long way uh, to go. So as I sit here today as a, a woman leader uh, in running an ASX company in financial services in, in high tech, uh, my path was possibly not one that would be obvious to get to this position. So if we can just go down to the next slide. Here you'll see my family. So I am a woman, I am a business leader, but I'm also a mother. So I have five children here, they are um, in this photo. And they've all gone on this journey with me uh, and learned about how to have an entrepreneurial and, and a mother who, who loves technology and, and builds technology. So my uh, story very quickly, um, as I mentioned, was not a straight path. So I actually only ever wanted to be a farmer originally. Then I went on to study agriculture. Uh, I left uni, became a police officer. I was in the cops for four years, um, back in the, the day when things were, were pretty, pretty corrupt. So I was there for about four years. 
uh, as a bit of an act of rebellion. I left, I went back and did an undergraduate degree, then a master's degree. At the same time, me along with a couple of my friends bought a nightclub, super useful, having been an ex-police officer and then being a nightclub owner, that worked very well. And then I went on to do a PhD. So my thesis was the role that computers played in replacing human leaders. So that I finished that in quite a long time ago, 20, 2007. And I was one of the first academic thinkers to really start to look at what role will computers and robots play in either replacing or substituting humans in the workplace. And, and this is an area of great passion for me. And I'm not an engineer, but I am an experienced technologist and I come from the sociological organisational design part of it. So after the PhD, I went on to found a couple of companies. One is AC, ACA Research, a full service market research firm. Another one called Fifth Quadrant, which is a human centered design firm. And then about five years ago, I took all the experiences I had and I really thought it was the time to invent something new that would be artificially intelligence based. So I did the initial seed funding myself, took some money out of the mortgage and, and put together um, with some you know, friendly engineers, a basic prototype of a machine learning based robot that would be able to guide humans to, to do particular tasks. So I set that up originally in Australia. Then within six months, I thought I'd go to the US. So I took two of the younger children, the ones on either end of the, this slide with me and actually sat the children in the room when I, I pitched for, for my first business and first funding in the US. So that was uh, successful. And, and today we, we remain having a, a US office and, and an Australian office. So the journey you know, has been wonderful, but um, equally hard as easy, I think, or equally good uh, as bad. So I want to share the good and the hard with you now. So if we just go to the next slide, I'll, I'll talk about the things that were really the highlights that I was able to achieve. So definitely founding an AI company from the start. No one five years ago was really doing too much in AI and we didn't really know what we're doing. Uh, so I had to kind of figure our way through it. That was one thing. Uh, setting up a company, uh, particularly as, as, a, as a, a mother with children in tow, going to the US and setting that up was, was I think, a, a great achievement. Listing on the stock exchange, as I mentioned, we, I was also successful in, in raising over the five years about $25 million and able to win big accounts in, in global accounts such as HSBC and Nationwide. And I built the business purposely from day one with a strong focus on ethics and a diverse workforce, particularly across uh, gender, um, sexual orientation and uh, race. So we have that. And, and what I found, unfortunately, is that that's quite an unusual thing in high tech. Uh, predominantly my experience in high tech is that it's a very hyper masculine environment, as it is also in the on the stock market, also hyper masculine. So for whatever reason, I find, in financial services too, we often sell to financial services companies. I've ended up in three hyper-masculine environments. And so my role there, other than being a business leader, is definitely to start to carve the way out for women so that women perhaps don't have to do some of the, have some of the challenges that I've had. The next slide goes into some of the, the harder moments that I've had. Um, and and you'll see here the, the top one. So this was a, wow, just an amazing story. So this is when I first listed the company and we went out and were seeking investment into the business. Went to Melbourne and pitched in front of a, a whole lot of investment houses. Uh, literally, it was all male. There was not a single female in any of the investor um, meetings I was going to. And then we were offered a million dollars into the business, which I was very excited about. That was um, a huge amount of money. But the investors said that there was one condition in order for them to give the money. And I said, oh, well, that's obviously going to be revenue or number of customers. And, and they said, no, it, it's actually that we want you, the female CEO, to take your nose ring out. So you might be able to see I've got this like cool nose ring in. But this was actually, the one I had in was actually much smaller than this. And, and I was gobsmacked. I was thought, what can you say to that? It had nothing to do with the business, had nothing to do with the performance. It had to do with how the female leader looked and that I was uh, looked not as they were used to. So I obviously said, 
no, thank you very much for your offer, but I'm not going to accept your money. And then the next day I went out and bought this nose ring, which is uh, much um, bigger. And then I love the nose rings that the beautiful Indian women wear when you're getting married and you have, have it that connects to your ear. So I've got one of those as well in case I ever need to do any really good pitching. So that was, you know, that was a, a challenging moment. And then in the next piece here, I've, I've cut out something actually from a chat room, which was some investors talking about uh, my business, Flamingo. And here they say, look, I think a factor that's playing into, into how the stock is going is that the, female, uh, the CEO is a female. I've been surprised when I've introduced a stock to some of my friends and laid out the business case and they all agree and, and nod their heads, but several of them pull up short as soon as this investor told them that the company is run by a woman. So there it is right there. This is recent times that there's still considerable bias or unconscious bias by you know, people in the workplace when they're dealing with, with female leaders. So we just have to take that as a fact. But whereas I used to get upset by this, I've really learned now the very best way and the very best emotion to attach to it is that of compassion. Because I'm sure these people are not trying to be difficult, but they just don't know. They're not used to dealing with women. They don't know how to um, uh, interact with us. So often they may default to some behaviours like, like this. So my role now is very much to uh, support women and help create paths for women, but also to support the men as they learn to deal with women in the workplace. In my sector, artificial intelligence, only one in 10 engineers is a woman, but hopefully through the work that some of us in, in leadership are doing, we'll see that increase. So my feeling, strong feeling is about uh, helping men understand how to interact and do business with us as women. Okay, on to the next slide. So one of the things I've just talked about is this notion of bias. And that is bias against or towards women in the workplace, and that's just our physical selves. But the other thing I've learned being in the field of AI is that there is huge amount of bias also in the technology, in the algorithms, in the data that is running our world. So what I'd love each of you to do, please, is just get out your, your phones and Google one of these four uh, topics, so best CEOs in the world, most intelligent people in the world, unprofessional hairstyles or professor style. Now, remember, I'm actually a professor. I'm an adjunct professor at the Australian Graduate School of Management. Just hold that image of me in your mind as you Google what the internet thinks professors should look like. So if you Google one of those hit images, you will see a world <laughs> unfold that is highly biased. So I'll just run through um, whilst you're doing that. When you Google best CEOs in the world, it is predominantly white, silver-haired um, males. Most intelligent people in the world is literally the same. Unprofessional um, hairstyles, Google will present predominantly women of colour with Afro hairstyles. And when you Google professor style, it'll come up with uh, quite good-looking white men with dark hair and tweed suits. I think there is a couple of Harrison Ford shots out of... Um, uh, his movies, but there's certainly no professors that look like me presented by Google. So what this means is that we really face a huge challenge going forward, not only bias in the workplace, but bias in the technology and the code and the data that is being used to design our world. So I'm absolutely dedicated now, and in fact today have launched a new business. If we could go to the next slide. called Ethical AI Advisory. And so I was so concerned about the level of bias that potentially can be built into artificial intelligence that I've now set up this business which acts as an advisory service to organisations in order to be able to design, code and deploy AI ethically so we're not faced with huge challenges um, with regard to dis discrimination and unfair treatment of women or minority groups. So these eight principles I've been working on in, with the Australian Government, Minister Andrews, who is the uh, Minister for Technology and also the Human Rights Commissioner, Ed Santo, 
and I have helped uh, put together a, a framework and toolkits around these eight principles, so human, social, environmental well-being, human-centred values, fairness, privacy protection and security, reliability and safety, transparency and explainability, contestability and accountability as the core principles that should be built into artificial intelligence. Now, I don't think it just needs the AI. I think this should apply to all emerging technology and all technology generally. They're just good, sensible principles. So my uh, commitment now, in addition to running um, Flamingo, is uh, where I get good hands-on experience as a practitioner, is to now be an advisor and a consultant to help make sure that we do this technology and we do it well. And then finally on the last slide, what I'd like to do is just call out a couple of things and why um, sessions like this are so important. We are, if we look to government, we see government is about five years behind the technology industry of where we're at in building this new tech. And then if we look to business leaders like the tech giants, we don't see a lot of leadership or certainly not collaborative leadership in this regard. So I think it will come to us as leaders ourselves to start to be the ones that really go forward and create this ethical world of technology. And so I would love to invite all of you going forward to remain being very tech savvy, investigate all new technology, learn about artificial intelligence, be very purposeful. Know that you can actually bring your own values and what's meaningful to you forward. And we'll, we'll hear Navita, who's, who's built a business like um, based on her purpose and, and what's meaningful to her in a minute. But you can also do that even if you're an employee. Make sure that you're always augmented by tech. Trial, take risks, experiment with technology, perhaps technology that you're not even currently using at work, but newer tech technologies like artificial intelligence. Learn all, the, all that you can. I've put two good books down here. The Most Human Human, What AI Teaches Us About Being Alive, and Human Plus Machine. And I'd add a third one, which is called Invisible Women by um, uh, Carolina Criado Perez. Fabulous book. And then know that you actually can be leaders in this field. The technology is so new and also the Ethics and purposeful technology is so new, regardless of how old you are, where you're up, in, up to in your career, you can absolutely be a leader. Thanks very much, Flo. Thank you, Katrina, for sharing your story from the challenges to how you overcame them and now to how you're helping other businesses. It truly is inspiring. Thank you. And now we're going over to Nivella. Nivella, thank you very much for being here. I'm looking forward to hear your story and I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you so much, Fleur. And uh, Katrina, it was absolutely inspiring. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Niveda. I'm the CEO and founder of TrashCon. Well, uh, before I begin uh, this entire talk, let me just put across a disclaimer. This is not going to be about inspiring you, motivating you, or giving you some information. All I'm going to do is share with you my very, very humble journey. And before I begin, let me ask you a question. Can we go to the next slide, please? So, um, how many of you, uh, you know, have, have this particular dream, an idea, or maybe even a thought that, you know, you could, you could fix something around you that is bothering you. It, it could be about you, it could be about your family, it could be about absolutely anything, but you know, some thought, some idea, or even a dream that you feel maybe with your abilities and skills, you could possibly create a change. If you have a dream, please do type in yes. I know it is through YouTube and Facebook as well, but whoever is accessing through WebEx, it'll be great. Well, uh, I too had a dream three years ago. And uh, I used to see, you know, the, the slide that you're seeing here is uh, the kind of uh, scenario that I used to see every time I get out of my house. And this is very, very uh, normal in almost all the developing countries. This is a usual site. So 
But apart from it being a very bad site and having the worst trench that you can possibly imagine, it also takes lives. It causes 22 different types of diseases. It is burnt, you know, overnight, and it causes all sorts of respiratory diseases, right? And it was taking a toll on those I love and those I know. And that's when I realized that, you know, instead of cribbing about it and blaming the government for it, which I was integrally doing it along with all the people around me, I thought, why can't I do something about it? Can we go to the next slide, please? This is where the waste ends up. So yeah, it is cleared from outside my house and it gets dumped in a place like this. You see, you see there are people out there, there are people and animals there. Well, their average lifespan is hardly 40 years. So this is the kind of, they're not even living a life of a human. It is, it is way less than a human. And this is rampant. 95% of the waste in India alone is being dumped like this. And this is not just about India. It's about every developing country. And when developed countries have a lot of land left, so yeah, they can afford dumping it. But this is a scenario, and I realized, why, why is there no solution about it? Why is, why is there nobody doing anything about it instead of just you know, propagating that everybody should take care of their waste responsibly? Everybody is. But still, this is the scenario. And going a little deep uh, into the subject, I realized, can we go to the next slide? this is how the waste looks like. You see that blue color cover there? That blue color plastic bag has sanitary napkins, it has diapers, it has plastic bags, it has, it has food, it has metal, it has stone, it has glass. It has absolutely everything that is in your mind right now. Even dead animals. Well, what can anybody do with this waste other than burning it or dumping it, right? And that is what is happening. Now, that's when I realized that, you know, there should be something, there should be, as an engineer, it just came to me that why can't technology try and solve this? Why can't something be there that can possibly solve it? So, so you know, I, I, I started brainstorming and I thought, why not come up with a system that can take all of this trash and sort it automatically into plastic waste, kitchen waste, metal waste? It was simple. Because the moment I sort it, the kitchen waste and the food waste can be converted to biofuel. The plastic waste or all kinds of non-biodegradable items can be recycled and the metals can again be stored. Very right? simple idea and I thought it could be done. So I went and pitched this to the so-called experts in you know, waste management and machineries and all of them had one thing to say in common. Guess what? Can we go to the next slide? It's impossible. Impossible, Niveda. Nobody has done it, and it's an absurd idea. And those who have tried have failed. And this is why they failed. A, B, C, D. This is why they failed. Well, that's exactly when I thought. But then somebody has to do it, right? But their uh, th th their opinions apart. Even I was in the final year of my graduation. I was 21. I had no team, and I was just just an undergraduate. And I had absolutely no clue of how to run a business. I come from a background where my parents are government uh, service, they're serving the government. And they had no idea of how a business should be run. And definitely machine is equal to manufacturing and I had absolutely no idea of it. So all the so-called possibilities of starting a company or having your own technology was out of question. So I had my own framework of limitations and I was very convinced. And I had a great job, in, job offer in hand and good scores. I thought my life is all set and I will look about uh, and I will think about this passion maybe 10 years down the lane, you know, when I have good amount of money. And that's, that's what it was. And I was very convinced. Then I give a ring to my mother and I say, uh, hey, mom, uh, I have this idea and I, you know, I have this brilliant solution, but maybe I'm not going to take it up because, you know, we also come from a really me, uh, middle class family. We have very less savings. So I don't think we can do anything about it. And to that, my mom says, uh, but if not you, who? I mean, come on, somebody has to try and do it. And I say, are you kidding me? You don't even, you don't have the resources to do it. And she says, look, I have $2,000, just $2,000 in her savings. And she says, I'll give it to you. And you try it out. And I say, look, it's going to fail. So uh, what are you even talking about? And she says, look, try, some, try somewhere. And it's okay. It's okay if you fail, but at least try until all the possibilities are exhausted. Well, there was this angel who was supporting me and there was this entire world who was telling me I was absurd. But somehow, Somehow I went with this, this particular passion of you know, trying and solving something about it. But well, I was about to regret. Can you go to the next slide? Six months. 
six to seven months, this was my office. You see that? That's a dump site. This is a dump site, which you will see in most of the municipality wards in developing countries. And in this particular area, there are only drunk and unskilled men. So I was here with my small prototype and, you know, taking waste. And they, were, they used to look at me, crazy lady. They used to stare at me and then they gave up. I used to go there every day, try out different, different, uh, you know, apparatus, different combinations to see what may possibly work. And to top it all, there was no AC chair or anything. But there was not even a washroom to basically, you know, the basic sanitation facility was also not there. But that's where I was going. I wasn't telling my mom and dad that, you know, I was going to the dump site as my office. But that's how the six months went. Let me go to the next slide to show you what happened after that. So during these six to seven months, I came up with this small machine, which could do only one kg per hour. One kg is just a waste that a house generates, you know. And uh, literally, the waste was going in different direction. The plastic was coming in kitchen waste, and kitchen waste was coming in plastic. It was pathetic. But I went ahead and made the next machine. Can we go to the next photo, please? The next machine. This could take 50 kg per hour. Again, the efficiency of segregation is pathetic, around 50 to 60 percent, probably. But then somehow, I learned a lot of things from here. And I went ahead and made a bigger machine. And this, I was about to place it in a proper dump site. This could take 200 kgs an hour. And when I made this, I was very, very convinced that, you know, I had come to 75 to 80 percent efficiency. And that was also a huge uh, milestone. And I was very convinced that maybe this, this is it. I could possibly do it. And by this time, I had exhausted all the resources I got from my mother, from a couple of government grants. So I had to prove it and, you know, start either selling it or get more funds. So when you remember all those people who told me it's not possible, well, I called them and I said, look, this is a machine. I am made it happen. And all of those uh, people came in. They did come. And I switched on the machine, but well, there was a small boulder that went in. And it went in because the operator was unskilled and did not actually know what has to be done. But when it went in, the entire machine broke down. It broke down and it was a pathetic failure in front of them. And when that happened, of course they were saying, we told you so. But in my mind, I was very convinced that I have made a big fool of myself. I spent seven months doing doing all of this nonsense, but it has ended up nowhere. I couldn't do anything. And I was very convinced that the world was right and I, I was wrong. So I, I went to my go-to mentor, uh, you know, uh, can we go to the next slide? I went to my go-to mentor and I told him that, um, you know, this is Swarab Jain. He's a chartered accountant and he was he, he had both business uh, expert, expertise as well as the tech expertise. And so he was my go-to mentor. And I told him, look, uh, I think I did enough and I'm going to give up because it's not going anywhere and I'm shooting in the dark. And he says, uh, but why don't, you, why, don't you, why don't you try even a little more? You know, if not, you who? And I say, look, that's great. It's great uh, to give a lip service, but why don't you come on ground and see the reality for yourself? And he did come. He did come and when he saw the challenges that were there, he realized what it is. And he, he realized the impact that it could create to a billion lives, literally. So he spent a day with me and it went on to a, to a week. It went on to a few months, and eventually what I found was that my go-to mentor had eventually become a co-founder, a co-founder who had the same vision of impacting a billion lives like me. And together with the reinforced strength and support, we started putting across a team, a team that was as crazy as us, as passionate as us. Can you go to the next slide, please? that came from different universities. You see this? this? This was also one of the dumb site areas where we used to sit and, you know, assemble our machine. And this was a team that was so passionate. And literally, we, you know, if you do not work with the material that you have, you're, you're designing the solution for it will never work. And that's exactly what we did. And we spent not days, not months, not years. We spent two full years sitting in these dumb sites trying to figure out what is this? That can that can segregate it and why am i why am i telling you it is so difficult imagine look at your own dustbin it changes every day isn't it is there even a single day that your waste composition is almost exactly the same no right so what we were trying to build was a black box that will take all kinds of unknown variables and give out known variables scientifically put it is impossible right to top it all all the kinds of variables there are different seasons there is there's different festivals and there's, there's so much of dynamism in waste that every day our values used to change. And every day we had to brainstorm new and newer solutions. And of course, there was a huge 
money crunch because this was a new idea nobody wanted to support it but that's how it was it was two years of not giving up even when we had exhausted all the possibilities of solving a problem but still we hoped that next stage we could solve it it was two years of not giving up and trying to you know try and find out any funds that we could to possibly help us through it was two years of sleepless nights of of thinking what is it that could possibly solve this solution it was two years of literally not giving up every single day let me tell you every single day and after two years my friends after two years the machine that we made was not segregating 50% it was not segregating 60% it was not segregating 80% it was segregating over 95% can we go to the next slide please after 2 years after 2 years we built the world's first completely automated completely automated sorting unit this could separate any waste be it uh, waste from the house or waste from the street waste from the school waste from anywhere it is biodegradable waste non biodegradable waste and metals over 90 to 95% efficiency and and remember the person who was operator who was unskilled and drunk well i know he's going to be my operator so we made it so beautifully uh, you know efficient that it can be operated by a 10 year old we made it so compact that it can be placed in a bedroom we made it extremely power efficient that it can run with a apartment's electricity and of course this is one of its kind we have it's, it's patented that's that's exactly what happened can we go to the next slide to see the transformation this is this is what happened these are real images you see the one to the left that is the photo that i showed you in the beginning and that got segregated into biodegradable and non biodegradable these are real images this is the efficiency with which it is segregated well this biodegradable that you're seeing here it is all your kitchen waste food waste canteen waste it can directly become become compost for thousands of farmers it can become biogas that can fuel thousands of houses or it can become any kind of biofuel that you can possibly imagine but think about it the audacity that we had even before we made the first machine that can segregate waste we already were making the machine that will recycle the output also so by the time we finished the machine that was considered impossible can we go to the next slide made a machine that can segregate those plastics you know you saw the plastics there which is generally in your oceans which is there everywhere around you plastics multi layered plastics like your pringles cover and all sorts of covers so we convert all of them into these recycled boards you see the shine that you're getting it looks like marble so we make this into boards and you can imagine this looks something like plywood and particle board that you used to make your wooden doors and furniture and you know the the windows it looks something very similar to that and out of this can we go to the next slide all these products are made out of that trash that you saw lying outside my street right you see these ottoman chairs you see the table you see the planter you see the rack all of this is made out of trash that was burning or getting dumped can we go to the next slide please These are some of the racks that we are selling to Pepsi. Can we go to the next slide, please? Again, made out of the waste that you saw. Can we go to the next slide, please? So this is the this is the most beautiful thing that has happened to us with the waste that is lying on the streets and sorting it with using our equipment and recycling it. We made benches and desks, benches and desks that provide the basic infrastructure in several government schools in India. well these are the kids i i got a, i got a letter from the teacher saying that these kids have never sat on benches and desks to write an exam and this was the first time they were sitting in benches and desks but let me tell you what is the best part they come from extremely underprivileged backgrounds but today they understand what is recycling they know the waste that goes out of my house can come back as value that is what we could show by providing them this infrastructure and this was the most beautiful impact and already we we have impacted 3000 kids and we are going uh, you know almost 5 to 6 common schools every month can we go to the next slide well you remember all those people who said that uh, this machine is absurd it can't be made nobody will buy it well some of the biggest corporates and some of the biggest municipalities were our customers even before the machine was ready we started getting orders that was the kind of demand it generated 
can we go to the next slide and of course i mean uh, you know we in just you remember we started with $2000 in just less than 2 years and very few months of even launching the product we raised 2 and a half million dollars we had half a million dollars in projects and half a million dollar in grants and not just in india almost the entire world including bahamas islands maldives and thailand we are speaking to the ministry level to install these units across because it's the same problem everywhere can we go to the next slide please and we were presenting to the prime ministers the united nations to some of the some of the prime ministers and ministers of several countries can we go to the next slide we were getting recommendations from some of the greatest people some from some of from the prime minister's office itself can we go to the next slide please we were covered in 150 plus media publications in germany us india everywhere but let me tell you all of these things put together are not what i cherish the most can we go to the next slide what i cherish the most is the rock bottom hits that we had the rock bottom hits that pained so hard that we did not feel like getting up but we did and those are the most beautiful moments which i'll cherish now and 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 forever and what i would like to tell regarding this entire journey is can we go to the next slide please i felt like giving up every single day for the past few years i i'm not i'm i'm being very frank here i really felt like giving up every single day can we go to the next slide but well i did not but what happened when you do not give up and you really want to give up is that something magnificent happens something beyond your knowledge or understanding or even your perception happens and that's what happened can we go to the next slide and the thought of giving up literally gave up on us that's that's exactly what happened now now everything that is impossible is something that we can do because we don't have the thought at all but you know let me tell you for all the kids out there who are trying to take up a new course and your family is totally against you uh, for all those people who who whose peers are taking up a different course and you want to take it because you think you can do a huge uh, something out of it for all those budding entrepreneurs who think you can solve a huge problem with your abilities and skills but you think age is a problem funding is a problem team is a problem let me tell you i am a very ordinary girl very ordinary girl who come up from who has come in a very normal background but i had just one thing i had a dream i had a dream that 20 years down the lane when i will be telling a story to my daughter saying data once upon a time there was trash and my daughter says can we go to the next slide mom what is trash and that this is the only dream that i have had this is the only dream that has burnt all the failures that came along our way and that's all i can say a very ordinary girl who could do all of this and if i can do it why can't you wherever you are whatever you, whatever it is that you are aiming for why can't you do it right so let's take a moment let's take a moment and can we go to the next slide let's take a moment and write down wherever you want to write that is and write down what is that what is that one dream that you have this could be something as big as i want to solve all the pollution in the world or it could be something like i want to take my dream course or it could be something like i want to really do uh, you know ai like katrina or or you know I, it could be it could be absolutely anything that you can possibly dream so just write it down write it down so that you know and the world knows and well if you have done that can we go to the next slide please write on that one thing that is limiting you from going up to your dreams for me it was a framework of limitations but for you if it is that one thing it could be family it could be funds it could be it could be team it could be peer pressure it could be absolutely anything but just write it down and while you're writing it down let it go it look it may look very huge and significant right now but when you start flying very high you'll not be able to see it and that's exactly what happened to me and again i would like to reiterate that you know if 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 a normal person like me can do something of this sort that the world says wow this is impossible i'm sure each one of you can and that's all i would like to leave you with thank you so much love you all thank you zena wow thank you very much for sharing your story i sure. just i'm thank so you. inspired by your first machine versus the end result of this massive machine that cannot be segregated away but also turn it into furniture fantastic thank you thank you so much okay now let's go to the questions 
had a few questions coming in. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat box and I will ask them to Katrina and Yvetta. I had a question coming in for Katrina. Katrina, what is the best way to get into a career in artificial intelligence? A great question. So I think there's a couple of paths to go on and I also inspired by Nevetta's um, journey that we've just um, shared. I think that uh, it doesn't have to be just getting into uh, a linear path to, to get to um, a career in AI. So I think there are ways that you can start yourselves learning and experimenting and trialling with AI so you start to learn about it in order to improve your skill set so then you can actually start to apply or pitch yourself into businesses that might be AI focused. So there's the obvious ways that you can um, go and do a university course in AI, but I actually think the better way to do it is to just be reading books, listening to podcasts, getting your hands on open sourced AI, start to play with it. And if Nevada can build a massive now global business that um, sorts trash using um, uh, sophisticated advanced technology, then I also agree that each of you can start to play and learn about technology uh, by doing it yourselves and get these skills. So I say learn about it, read about it, listen, play with it, experiment, build your confidence, and then go and pitch yourself to the organisation that you want to work with that is AI focused, and then even um, present to them what you might have developed um, that, that is based on artificial intelligence. And AI is so simple now and so commoditized, you actually don't need to be an engineer in order to um, be building these uh, machines. So um, that, that's what I would, that's how I would respond. Rather than just looking for jobs that are advertised for AI, building your own career proactively uh, in that way. Thank you, Katrina. I have a lot of questions coming in, so I'm moving on to a question for Niveda. Niveda, how did you find a mentor? Well, uh, so I actually, um, I was, I was, I was my, I was a client of my uh, mentor turned co-founder, and uh, he had, uh, you know, like I mentioned, he not only w was from a technological background, but he had the finance expertise in business and finance as well. And uh, although, uh, you know, I was his, uh, you know, mentee, and I was, I was getting a lot of, uh, you know, uh, advice from him. What actually happened was that particular situation that I told you that you know I called him onto the called him onto the field and showed him the challenge. I realized that during the course of time he was somebody who wanted to create an impact that could touch a billion lives. And it's very important that you know a mentor or a co-founder or anybody that we associate ourselves with should have the same vision that we carry. Otherwise, the entire thing is going to fall apart. And luckily for me, I found somebody who has an exact same vision. Uh, and, and really, really, we are very greedy to touch a billion lives. And when I saw this in him, I, I asked if he could, uh, you know, join me in the company as a co-founder. And uh, it took a while uh, because, you know, he, he comes from a, he built his own firm and uh, in just three years, they had amazing revenues and he had, he had a plush office in the middle of the city. And to come from there to the dump site was quite a transition. Uh, but that's exactly what happened. And when I asked him today, why is it that he chose he says, uh, when you see somebody like you working uh, stubbornly in ways and trying to solve a problem, I mean, uh, I mean, this is what pulls us all towards you. It's it's just the passion. So I think that's what I can say. I mean, the entire team and being investment, be the be it everything. It was just the single-minded passion that you know I really want to solve this problem, and that's what attracted everyone, including the mentors, the co-founders, and everyone. Yeah, that's what happened. Thank you, Nivela. I can see that passion is key here. Uh, I've got a mentor myself, and I can highly recommend anyone out there to find a mentor because it can definitely help you. Now, I've got another question coming in for Katrina. Katrina, this one is coming in from YouTube, from Pluti. How would a current AI model look like compared to the ethical and balanced AI model? Wow, that's a great question. So, if we Think about what AI is. AI is essentially data plus algorithms plus some form of automation. So 
an unethical AI might use data that is already full of bias. Now, a great example of this was the recent Apple Card launch. So Apple Card launched a couple of months ago. It was backed by Goldman Sachs. It was based on algorithms and an AI that determines what credit limit you are allowed to have based on you providing some financial data. But what it did, it when a husband and a wife with exactly the same financial data uh, gave it to the algorithm to determine the credit limit, it was giving on average 10 times more credit to the males than, or the husbands than the wives. And even Steve Wozniak, who's the co-founder of Apple, he submitted his financial details and his wife did, and in fact gave him 20 times more credit than his wife. Now, the challenge with this is obviously that the machine has discriminated against females. And the reason it's done that is it's been trained on data that is historical, that has a far greater percentage obviously of males who have been awarded credit. So the real challenge comes in making sure the data sets are clean and all bias is removed out of them. And the next challenge comes in making sure that the algorithms themselves, as they learn, and as they self-improve, are also doing that in a non-biased way. So another quick example is that Amazon had a, an AI that was recruiting people into the business, and what it did, it ended up skewing or referring men into jobs in Amazon because it had been trained previously on historical data but then it learnt to pick up if on a CV there was the word woman so or women, so someone might say, oh, I was head of the women's chess club or I went to women's college, it would, the algorithm then learnt to discount that CV. And so no CVs were being put forward that mentioned the word women. So that's where the algorithm can start to go. And then the actual automation itself is, is the final de determinant where a decision might be made. And so an ethical AI model will have uh, frameworks and guidelines at each of those stages to make sure that it is fair, that it is without bias, that it does not discriminate, that it's been made safely, that it's reliable, that it has human-centred values in mind. Now, my company, Flamingo AI, is one of the first companies that's working with the government principles to trial this framework at the moment. We're a couple of months away from actually coming out with a really solid case study that shows what worked and what didn't work and how you would really put this ethical AI in, in place. So please you know, stay in touch with me through Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, I'm on all of them, and, and we'll, we'll share this as we go forward. But the, the models will be quite different to ethical AI, to non-ethical AI, quite, quite different. Oh, that's an explanation, Katrina. Thank you. I'm very shocked by the fact that 20 times more credits and CVs just being eliminated when uh, they come from women. I'm glad they picked up on that and I hope they fixed it. So thank you for your answer. We are moving on to a question for Niveda. Niveda, a uh, question coming in from YouTube by Swaria. And the question is, you developed a trash bolt, which is Converting plastic waste to objects such as furniture. How does this exactly work? So, how is plastic converted to materials such as furniture? All right. So, uh, there are two things. Uh, Trashpot was a machine that basically sort the mixed waste into plastics and kitchen waste. The next machine is the recycling unit that converts the plastics into uh, materials such as ply or furniture board. Now, the second part is what we are asking about. Uh, regarding this, we use a series of mechanical unit operations that is all programmed to work in a sequence. And these mechanical unit operations subject the plastics. These are all kinds of plastics. Let me tell you, it is, it is your low-density plastic. It is a kind of micro uh, plastic that was so-called banned, but very much there. It is these multi-layered plastic that has aluminum foil, that has, that has plastic cover to it. It is everything put together. And we subject it to a series of heat and temperature uh, conditions. And of course, the final thing that we do is compression. And this compression is again, uh, you know, achieved by several parameters such as pressure, temperature, that is, that is again made to suit that particular plastic condition. And that is how the board is made. So 
to put it in short, we use pressure and temperature with compression unit operations to come up with a material like board. And again, we do not, uh, you know, this process was also made in a very beautiful way. Why, why it is beautiful is because, you know, the board that we make at the end, we made it in such a way that tomorrow you buy the board and make a furniture out of it. And after 10 years, it breaks. When it breaks, it comes back to me and I can remake the same, same uh, furniture or same board out of it because I'm not adding any chemical resins. What we add is organic resins, thereby making the entire process of recycling again recyclable. So that's the entire chain that uh, we follow in making the boards. Uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Nivada. And a question coming in for Katrina from YouTube. Um, do you think women have a unique opportunity to make a difference in the world as we know it today? My answer is definitely yes to that. So I think we are at a time where a couple of things are all lining up in order for women to start playing a much stronger role in, in how technology is going to be built, how it's going to be developed and how society is going to be, be run. So one of the things uh, that is just even beyond technology that I've been doing a lot of work on and writing about at the moment is, is crisis leadership. So we uh, in Australia had a, a terrible experience uh, over the su summer, so December through to February, where we had uh, the terrible bushfires, which, which decimated 46 million acres of land, 34 people killed, 6,000 properties um, destroyed. And in fact, my family lost a family farm. And also we had a, a family house in two separate locations and the fires destroyed both. So I started researching what type of leaders are needed in order to lead us at times of crisis. And then, of course, we were hit with the COVID-19 current environment that we're in. And what came out very clearly was that the leadership behaviours associated with the feminine arch archetype for women are very well suited for leading through crisis and for starting to develop a much more stronger, ethical, purposeful society. So some of these leader behaviours include um, deep empathy, collaboration, um, uh, analytical thinking, visionary thinking, um, also uh, awareness of advanced technologies, being able to detect signals, having a multifocal lens, being able to uh, have multi-stakeholder uh, multi approaches. And these types of behaviours are now very, very well suited to the current environment plus also how we need to de develop technology purposefully and ethically. So I think we've probably never been at a better time for us as women to start to be recognised for the leaders that we are. And, and many of you will have seen the great articles that have been coming out um, around COVID-19, identifying leaders such as the Prime Minister of Finland, uh, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, who are really leading the way in how the response to COVID-19 has best been done in their countries. So I think it's time and we must now really step up. And as I always say, as, as we're stepping up and, and being bold is always to take a sister with us. Whatever we do, just take a sister with you. I agree, Katrina, many opportunities for women here um, in technology. Going to move on to the next question, which is for Niveda. Niveda, I have a couple of questions um, about yeah. the sensors. So, from Spy and Ayesha, they are wondering what kind of sensors does your machine need in order to sort the garbage? So, um, so, uh, so, so the internal working of the machine is something that's patented, and we will not be able to reveal a lot of details. But let me tell you, uh, what is it that we uh, exploit? to basically segregate. So, uh, you know, the ways that uh, most of the developing countries have, have biodegradable and non-biodegradable mix. So you have a plastic cover and it has food sticking onto it, right? So the difference between a plastic cover that is wet and food waste is mainly moisture. So when I mean moisture, it is that the food waste, whatever be it, even if it is a dry uh, bread or whatever it is, it has inherent moisture of over 70 to 80%. While a plastic bag, which is drenching with, uh, say, some kind of liquid, 
is still not having more than 40 to 45 percent moisture content. This is a huge difference between biodegradable waste and non-biodegradable waste consistently over all parameters, even if it rains, even if it does not. This is something that is going to always remain. So this is one major aspect that we exploited. And uh, one of our mechanical unit operation basically removes the food waste from the plastic bag because you know in India or in many of the developing countries we have a tendency to tie up the plastic bag and throw it out in the out of our door. So it has a tendency to open it up to dislodge the biodegradable waste from the plastic cover and then use pressurized air and several other sensors like you mentioned to basically separate it based on moisture. So the higher moisture content which is the biodegradable waste having more than 80 percent moisture content is separated from the non-degradable waste. Again we also use other parameters like size but uh, yeah, that's something that I'll not be able to reveal in extreme detail. But yes, we do use moisture and size as the primary, uh, you know, parameters to exploit uh, the differences between biodegradable waste and non-biodegradable waste. Fantastic. Okay. Back, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I have another question coming in from Anushka, and she's asking Veda, what were some of the books or content? content that inspired you towards entrepreneurship. Absolutely. So of course, I, I love the books of Steve Jobs and Elon Musk. And apart from that, um, I, my main inspiration is uh, what did not just come from books. It came from my own family. It was my mother. So uh, she was a person who was, I can, I can call her a lioness. She, she's somebody who will go out and do, do the impossible. And I think she was, she's the reason why I am the way I am right now. And uh, if I, I, I'm not allowed to utter the words impossible or it can't happen. So I think that's how I was brought up. And I can say that if all parents, in fact, uh, you know, encourage their kids to take up the uh, path that is less uh, traveled on, uh, I think we could create a huge difference. And all, all, all credits go to, go to her. Apart from, of course, uh, the books definitely help me guide uh, the way ahead. And I definitely look up to leaders who have created a disruption, who have stood out against the odds and definitely look up to leaders who have had a really difficult time creating a, mesh, a company that is one of its kind. So I think, yeah, these are the kind of leaders I look up to. Thank you. One question for Katrina. We are about to end the show, so let's ask one more question. Katrina, um, I have here another one about the bias in AI. So how do you make sure that not just with Apple and with AWS, well, in general, how can we make sure that gender bias is removed from artificial intelligence? All right. Well, I think it, it starts with, again, the data sets. So if you are working in a company that is training uh, machines and algorithms, then what is super important is to make sure that there's rigor and process around looking at the data sets. And there are definitely some techniques. So an ensemble technique is one technique that's used in order to assess that the data set is without bias. There's various other ways that, that you can do that. So I think what we can do as women in, in business is just always to be asking the question. Ask the question of the data scientists. Ask the question of the people who are the ones who are putting the data together. Ask questions of the business owners who are responsible for the outcome of the AI decision. Ask them to show you how is this AI being designed to make sure that bias is removed and that it doesn't discriminate. And just ask them to be transparent. One of the challenges will be in, in AI, we call it black box AI. So black box AI is when the, even the engineers can't really explain what's going on. What we want them to be building is white box AI so that they very simply can open the machines and show you how the algorithms work, how the data is treated, and how the decisions are made. So, so I'd say definitely start with the data, but just be, uh, be the person in your business who asks these questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Katrina. And this is bringing us to the end of today's live Women Rock IT broadcast. I'd like to one more time thank Katrina and Niveda for your time. It is fantastic. I'm inspired by your stories. And uh, all presentations and recordings will be made available at the event. So for those of you on the call, you can find them on the Women Rock IT website. Also, as a reminder, because you are part of our audience today, this entitles you to enroll in our free Cisco Networking Academy courses. 
we have posted the link in the chat box. So take a look at these courses. They will open a world of opportunities for you. And one final thing, we really value your feedback. So please let us know what you thought of today and what you would like to hear next time. You can scan the QR code on the screen that will take you to a survey. And once you complete the survey, you will receive a certificate of participation. Uh, thank you very much for being here. I'm looking forward to the next event, which is Thursday, the 11th of June. And I wish you all a great day. Between what is hoped for and what can be, there's a bridge. Between the aspirations of a ball club and the greatest sports venue in America, there's a bridge. Between chaos and wonder, endangered and protected, there's a bridge. Built on technology that can solve Create, heal, inspire, and secure. A bridge. There from the beginning to where we stand today.